I'm Pete McCall, and welcome to episode 69 of All About Fitness. On this episode, I have Gary Gray, a physical therapist and founder of the Gray Institute. Now, I wanted to interview Gary because I'm staying on the theme of movement. The last podcast was with Gray Cook, and this week is, it's with Gary Gray. And just so you know, they are different people. It often gets confused, but Gary, who I interviewed today, is often called the father of function. And what we mean by that, and by we, I mean fitness industry, what I mean by that is he was one of the first people to take a look at the body and say, why are we training at one body part or one segment at a time? Why don't we train the entire thing as one structure? He started doing that a number of years ago. Now, the backstory is that when he first started out in physical therapy, he couldn't afford the equipment that, that many companies were trying to sell him in order to rehab, and I, I say rehab with air quotes, in order to rehab his, his patients. So Gary needed to find a better way to train the entire body to help his clients properly rehab. And so he created this concept of functional biomechanics, or, or what he calls chain reaction biomechanics. And it's a concept that he's been teaching for more than three decades. Well, that concept has now evolved to the Gray Institute. The Gray Institute is an education resource. You can find it online at grayinstitute.com. Gray Institute is an education resource for fitness professionals like myself, as well as physical therapists, chiropractors, and other professionals out there who focus on movement. A number of years ago, well, actually, I was in the first uh, class that the Gray Institute did in what he calls GIFT, the Gray Institute for Functional Transformation. That's where Gary, we spend 48 weeks understanding and learning the human body under Gary's tutelage to learn how to help clients and patients move better. So today on All About Fitness, Gary Gray and I talk about his concept of functional biomechanics, and why it's important to understand how the body moves. You know, as you can tell, this has been a theme that I've been, that I've been focusing on for a little while because we need to move better. Training in isolation won't make that possible. We need to train the body as one, one unit. We need to move and train the body as one single unit. So after Breed Word from a sponsor of All About Fitness, I'll sit down with Gary Gray, physical therapist and founder of the Gray Institute. Vicor Fitness is the maker of the new TerraCore, which is a step, bench, balance trainer, and multifaceted exercise tool combined into one single platform. Go to vicorefitness.com to see the newest piece of equipment that will be taking the fitness industry by storm in 2017. Use the code AAF to save 20% on purchasing a TerraCore of your own. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness. Vicor Fitness. Better results from better products. I'm Pete McCall with All About Fitness. On the line today with Gary Gray out of Adrian, Michigan. Gary, can you give us a little background about what it is that you do? Well, that'd be kind of tough. Uh, (laughs) I'm not sure what I do most of the time, but it's just an honor to be uh, talking with you, Pete. Uh, we're essentially an educational company that talks all about movement. Uh, what is movement? How do we move? How do we keep moving? And, uh, when we have pain or discomfort, uh, what's causing that? And, uh, so it's kind of a, a company called Gray Institute, uh, that we just study the science of movement and we try to apply that science to get people to move more effectively and efficiently. And, uh, for a, for hopefully a long, long time in their life. And now you've been doing this for a little while now, and I say that um, a little facetiously. What your background is in is in physical therapy, correct? Yeah, I started as a physical therapist. Uh, then I knew I needed to learn a lot more. Then I became an athletic trainer. Uh, then I went in to become a strength coach, and then I took a couple personal training certifications, and I realized the common denominator was all movement. And like you say, I'm the old guy. We've been doing this for a little over 42 years now, so... Uh, uh, I think we have the same desire as a lot of the people listening to this. We want to, we ourselves selfishly want to keep moving as well. So uh, we've been doing it for a long, long time. And now you've developed something called, you know, that you, you call it, I guess one way to term it is functional biomechanics. And you, you've termed, you've coined the term applied functional science. Can you give us a little overview about what exactly that is? Yeah. Um, essentially, applied functional science is. Uh, it's trying to understand all the sciences that have gone on before us that allow us to understand more about movement. Uh, in movement, we, we talk about drivers. In other words, what drives us to move and what drives us not to move. 
So as we get older, we know a lot of things drive us not to move. Uh, we know that there are other things that drive us to move. And so what we wanted to do is understand every driver that the human being deals with. And so the three sciences that make up applied functional sciences are the physical sciences, which is kind of the physics of it all. Um, it's gravity and ground reaction force and those things. And as we get old, we know that gravity seems to be less of our friend and more of our more of our enemy as our shoulders sloop down, as our hips get a little tighter, as we even have the fear of falling. Uh, the second science is the biological sciences. That's the drivers of when I move my hand, what happens to the rest of my body when I take a step with my foot, uh, when I turn and look somewhere with my eyes, uh, what, what happens to the body. So what drives the body to move? Uh, even the physiology of the body, when I when all of a sudden I feel this growling in my stomach, I'm driven to get up out of my chair and go get a you know, something out of the refrigerator. Uh, and then the, probably the big science is behavioral sciences. Uh, what, what encourages me, what discourages me, what empowers me, what seems to frustrate me? Um, what are those drivers that we think have a huge ramification on how we move and why we move and our ability to move? And uh, so those three sciences make up what we call applied functional science. And now the last one, behavioral science, let's touch on that for a second. Because, and I recently had a Anthony Carey on the podcast talking, talking about pain and pain management. So do you think that the way that a lot of people exercise now currently kind of drive them into pain? And how do you think that affects them overall? Well, I think, I think if you look at what we would call traditional exercise, so things that we kind of traditionally have done, sometimes it drives us to a lot of things. It drives us to uh, discouragement. Uh, we're not given an opportunity to improve. It dr drives us into discomfort. Um, we seem after a workout not to feel better. Uh, we, ca we kind of feel worse. And so that's a negative feedback loop that your body doesn't want to deal with very long. And so pretty soon it's going to shy away from uh, what we would call exercises that would make you feel better. Um, and a lot of times I think one of the behavioral drivers that drives us away is the lack of empowerment, allow uh, not allowing us to choose what we think is best for our body. But sometimes, you know, having somebody that doesn't really understand our body or doesn't understand our goals and wants and needs uh, kind of drive us through what we call the pro cattle prod of exercises. And uh, we intuitively know it doesn't make sense. We know what, what we're doing in our exercise doesn't help me pick up my granddaughter, doesn't help me walk with my wife, doesn't help me, uh, you know, throw the Frisbee for the dog. And it doesn't help me just feel like I'm getting younger. Sometimes, uh, I would say improper exercise makes us feel older. And, and improper exercise, meaning, and, and this is, I took a workshop with you a number of years ago. And just for listeners, I also went through Gary's uh, year-long mentorship program. Um, I hate to say it, about 10 years ago now. But the first time I took a workshop with you, Gary, you use, you use the description of Pooh Bear. You know, what does <laughs> Pooh Bear see and how does Pooh Bear warm up? And what do you mean by that? What can Pooh Bear teach us about exercise and getting ready? Say my favorite movement is I want to go for a jog. How would Pooh Bear get ready to go for a jog? Yeah, I, I love the fact that you brought that up because we still use that because um, I'm, I'm kind of like Pooh Bear. I'm a bear of very little brain and hopefully a big heart. But the interesting thing Pooh Bear had was common sense. Uh, you couldn't fool him. When he was hungry, he was hungry. Uh, when he wanted to go play uh, with Rabbit, he would go play with Rabbit. And when he just needed you know, a friend, he would grab Christopher Robin's hand and just take a walk through the forest. And so Pooh Bear doesn't outthink things. So the, the way you just put that is, is actually perfect. If you're going to warm up for running, the warm up should look a little bit like running. In other words, it should have the movement, the mobility moves. Uh, it should have the stability moves. Um, literally, if, if I saw you, you warm up for running, according to what we would call applied functional science or how we believe it should be done, Pooh Bear should be able to look at you and say, oh, my, it looks like you're going to go run. And somebody would say, Pooh Bear, how do you know that? And Pooh Bear would say, because the motions of the arms and the legs and the, the trunk in, in all what we would call three planes of motion look so much like running. It looks like you're getting the body ready to run. And we'd say, wow, Pooh Bear, that's, that's kind of fascinating. Because a lot of times, for instance, a warm-up program or a traditional warm-up program, we'd kind of do the traditional stretches, but 
Pooh Bear would say, I'm not really sure what you're getting ready for. It looks like you might be ready to lay down and take a nap. Uh, <laughs> or it looks like you might just have a cramp in your hamstring and you're lifting your leg up. Or And so Pooh Bear doesn't outthink things. He just goes, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna play golf, you probably look should look like you're warming up for golf. If you're gonna go run, it should look like a warm up for running. And so uh, uh, it's interesting that you kind of remember that Pooh Bear approach because we count on Pooh Bear a lot. Well, I think that's an important thing. And and do you think it's an appropriate way? Because I guess the question I'm asked: Do you think we make a mistake the way anatomy is traditionally taught, and and, and why? Yeah, um, and, and I, I think we 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 hold both both hold that. Uh, kind of uh, as to be a truth, anatomy by convenience is taught in segments or isolated. So uh, joints are looking isolated, muscles are origin insertion and isolated. And, but when a baby is born and starts to move, you know, on the ground and starts, you know, crawling and starts getting to upright function, the whole body moves. It's an integrated system. It's the whole thing affecting the whole thing. Um, and so, an isolated approach, I think we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. Uh, we started that years ago, and it seems to be hard to get away from. It seems to be easier. It seems to be more convenient. The problem is it has no validity. Um, that's not how the body works. Not how, that's not how muscles work. That's not how joints work. That's not how the nerves work. That's not how the body works. And therefore, um, if we try to apply that knowledge to trying to get somebody to move better, uh, we ourselves get frustrated because we realize th- there's no connection. Um, Pooh Bear would say, you know, when I go get a, a, a jar of honey, my whole body goes, especially my belly, uh, because when I reach for that jar of honey and I eat it, my, my belly wants to appreciate it and makes my feet tingle. <laughs> so at no point would he want just part of his body to have to figure out what muscle to move or what joint to move. And so, yeah, I think we've, uh, I think we've missed the mark. And I, I think, uh, you know, of course you and I, I think believe that, uh, to be true. Well, and the question I'd ask, do you think it would be better if we taught, if, if people are teaching anatomy as a function of what muscles do like during gait? You know, because when you look at, at the human body, Gary, I think we can agree that, that gait or walking becomes the default operating system. That, that's like w- what everything in our body is designed, designed to do efficiently. Do you think it would be more effective if we, in schools we taught, you know, people the, how muscles work when we walk? Yeah, I, I do. Because again, it's like a, the default button. In other words, most of the people we see, and most obviously they have some type of disease or an injury or process where they're uh, limited to a wheelchair. But understanding the body and gait is, if you can understand the body and gait, like you say, muscles and gait, then everything else gets pretty gets pretty simple. But even even understanding gait, for instance, we we know that you know, all the names of the muscles, when you ask, what is that muscle doing in the gait? It's, it's the answer is it's trying to get the one foot to move in front of the other because that's gait. And so if we learn basically the kind of the global function of muscles synergistically, as you indicated as a whole, not isolated in gait, um, all of a sudden we'd have a better appreciation for how all muscles function with all forms of function. And now, because in that situation, would it be appropriate to say that the hips and the shoulders work together? Yeah, we, we, we kind of say it's the nose to the toes, it's the feet, the hips and the shoulders all work in sync. And uh, literally, you can almost watch somebody walk and, and get a sense for kind of, are they in sync or are they out of sync? Because, you know, the foot drives the hip, which drives the shoulders, and the shoulders then drive the hips, which drive the feet. And when you see that all come together, especially in what we call the twisting plane or the rotation plane or the transverse plane, um, people who walk well and are destined to walk for a long, long time without much problem, all of that's in sync. So learning, learning those interactions between what happens in the shoulders and the spine and, of course, the very powerful hips and certainly the feet uh, would be very wise, as Pooh Bear would say. In other words, when he, he, he kind of giggles when he walks because he says, when, when I turn my shoulders more, my butt wiggles more, my feet seem to go faster. And, uh, and it seems like when my feet go faster, I can just get to that jar of honey a little quicker. And let's, let's shift gears for just a second here. And I want to um, ask you a little bit about youth, uh, youth sports because I think a lot of listeners, you know, the demographic I'm going after, a lot of listeners probably have kids that are probably, you know, in between 8 to 15 years old, give or take, who are playing youth sports. What do you think, what's the best way to help kids? If, if, if I have a kid 10, 11, 12 years old, what's the best way to get them to prepare for a sport? 
Because my fear is, Gary, that there are a lot of people out there that might spend a lot of money to send their kid to some kind of training camp that may not be appropriate for them. And with your experience, what do you think is just the best way to help get, get, be a kid more athletic or just better to, to be more active? Yeah, it's uh, it kind of goes back to the basics, uh, and that's a great question because I think um, we're seeing we're seeing at least in in many many cases the the wrong things being done. Hopefully for the right reason. Um, people are really trying to just get kids to be excel at certain things without a foundation of movement. And our our view is if you provide a a foundation of movement where a child is successful at moving every which way but loose with good mobility, good stability, that they can then build upon that foundation to be good, be a good pitcher, be a good soccer player, to kick the ball, to, you know, play hockey well, to be able to play basketball. What we're, what we do too early is we force the kids into skilling. What I mean by that is, you know, all of a sudden we have six, seven, eight year olds that are playing soccer and the coaches are trying to get them to kick a ball and dribble the ball and, basically learn skilling without understanding foundationally can they even balance on a foot can they lunge can they can they just decelerate their body from different slants are they you know keeping as you said the shoulders and the back and the hips and the feet in sync together um it's kind of like trying to teach a kid algebra without teaching them some basic math um we can con some kids into understanding algebra but it'll come back to haunt them with injuries and the inability to succeed. That's why we see, you know, seven-year-olds who play soccer, that 98% of them, by the time they're in sixth grade, they don't play soccer anymore. A great percentage of them are, are basically feel defeated. And they shouldn't feel defeated because we're making them do a book report without teaching them how to read or we're asking them to do you know, like I said, algebraic equations without teaching them, you know, one plus one. And in the movement world, we're asking kids to skill. We're asking them to do some very fine coordinated activities without giving them the foundation movement patterns. And now you t- you have the hot rock. Are you still doing the hot rock basketball camp? Yes, we are. And so how do you, how do you work in the movement skills? Because I know you do the whole, well, first, let's explain the, the matrix real quick, what the movement matrix is. And then how do you layer that in when you work with kids in a basketball camp? What are you really teaching them before you even get to the basketball component? Well, that's the fun part, because uh, those are the things we want them. You know, in a, in a week camp, you can do a lot of things, and there's a lot of things you can't do. One thing you can do is encourage kids and uplift them and show them that they are worthy and they have dignity. I can't make somebody a basketball player within a week, but I can teach them the skill set of the foundational movements that will allow them to have better movement skills so they can dribble ball better, have better work uh, footwork, be able to actually set their feet and be able to shoot the ball better. And But you know, again, I, I do care about their basketball ability, but I want them when they get kind of old like me, I want them to have a body that still works pretty good so they can enjoy their grandkids. So we teach them fundamental movements. In other words, we teach them lunges and reaches and balance reaches and all three planes of motion. Uh, In fact, we have about, oh, 140 of those matrices on on a free website called F2P Academy, where you just click on a matrix and all of a sudden you go, okay, yeah, I get it. That makes sense. Yep. If I started there, yep, just about any kid could do that. But then as you progress through the matrices, they involve more combinations of movements. And then as you get more combinations of movements, then all of a sudden the body is able to go, hey, wait a minute, I, I can do that. Again, the analogy could be, you know, you teach basic math, and then algebra, you teach the letters, and now we have words, and now we have sentences, and we ultimately want kids to write their own story with their own movement capability. So we teach them Here's what we hope that you do the rest of your uh, rest of the year to allow you to be good at whatever you want to be, whether you want to play the piano, or, you know, whether you want to play the violin, whether you want to, you know, it doesn't matter what we want. We just want your body to be healthy, but have the foundational movement properties. So whatever direction you want to go, you're going to be really good at. And we see that be that we see that really lacking in um, the way we educate kids in uh, physical movement. And do you think that has an effect? Because because that's one thing over the years that I've observed in uh, working with adults in health clubs, Gary, that's so powerful is I'll, I'll talk to somebody and like and they'll say, "Well, I never really worked out because I was never really an athlete." Why do you, do you do you think we make a mistake when we you know the way we teach PE right now in schools and and why? Yeah, I, again, I, I, the the bad news is is that it's really 
it's really our fault. Uh, it's not the teacher's fault. It's not the kid's fault. Um, we've kind of known the secret sauce for years, and we haven't been able to get it out there. And I think you just hit it perfectly. As soon as you perceive yourself not to be an artist, you're not going to do artwork. Uh, if you perceive yourself not to be a musician, you're probably not going to all of a sudden go into a sound studio and record your own song and uh, start singing uh, in front of people. Um, and we, we've done that with kids early on. We kind of group them as an athlete or non-athlete, or we have them do things that we try to prove to them that they just can't do. Um, and pretty soon they believe it. And pretty soon, not even pretty soon, even at fourth and fifth grade, we find out that close to 85% of kids don't perceive themselves as an athlete. Where in reality, if they were taken through the fundamentals of movement, uh, they all would consider themselves athletes. And I think the other thing we've done wrong, besides not teaching what we would call that movement literacy, teaching the literacy of movement, is we, we've not defined an athlete well. Um, we believe an athlete is, is somebody who understands how to take care of their body, understands movement literacy, understands how to improve upon their ability to move so they can do anything they want. But they ultimately are doing that um, to help others. They're, they're getting their body healthy so they can help others. Yep, the byproduct is you jump higher, run faster, and, you know, and beat up on, you know, people maybe a little tougher. But at the end of the day, if we could redefine what an athlete is, that's somebody that you, you do have to take responsibility. Uh, you have to, you know, put in the work. You have to put in the sweat equity. You have to basically what we call perspire. But the whole goal of perspiring, we believe, is that kids can then inspire each other, uplift each other, be there for each other, rake their neighbor's yard, uh, have the physical capability of saying, you know, I can I can help you there. And, oh, by the way, if I want to play a sport, um, great. But, again, as soon as we hear the word athlete, we think of ESPN athletes. Um, I have a couple cerebral palsy kids that are probably the toughest athletes you'll ever see because they work their tail off. And they're really an inspiration to other people, and they've dedicated their lives to helping others. And, well, if they can be an athlete, just about anybody can be an athlete. So I think we, we, we haven't given our kids the right foundation of movement literacy early in the school. Um, and, again, if you, go to, if you go to a fifth grade teacher and say, uh, what have you done movement skill-wise to prevent my daughter from having an ACL tear? 100% of them say, I don't even know what you're talking about. But the problem is they should know what we're talking about. They should know that the whole goal here is not only to achieve good movement ability, but to prevent my sons and daughters from injury. And like you said, from the demise of not even thinking they're an athlete or from the pain of exercise or activity, where in a very early part of their life, they've already said, that's not for me. That's not going to be for me. And then, as you say, if by chance you happen to see that adult in the health club, uh, a lot of the damage, a lot of the trauma has already happened. And, um, and, and it's kind of, it, I'd, I'd say what comes to my mind, it's kind of sad. Well, and, and on that point, you know, again, we'll come back to that to four letter word uh, of pain. Do you think exercise should cause pain or do you think physical activity should cause pain? I think it uh, depends on what your goals are. Um, I, I think, that, you know, especially for kids, I think if it's done right, it should not cause pain. I think if the kid then says, well, I want to run in the cross country meet, um, and we're going to pick it up and there, there should be kind of what I call that physiological pain of trying hard. But as far as musculoskeletal pain, uh, I can see no reason whatsoever why it should ever cause any pain if it's done right. Yeah. For uh, both kids and adults. Correct. I mean, cause, exactly. cause I think a lot of adults perceive that, you know, they still have this, you know, even 40 years after Jane Fonda, that we still have this no pain, no gain philosophy. And with your approach to training movement, people shouldn't end up a workout in pain. Correct. No, it pains. A, pains there for a reason. Uh, pains. Pains a great gift to us to let us know something's wrong. Pain. Pain. Pain never says, "Ah, this is good." Uh, pain. Pain usually says, uh, we're, "We're going down the wrong route. We're putting too much stress on the tissue. We've chosen the wrong movement. Uh, we're barking up the wrong tree." Um, you better find an alternative. The problem is, very few people are taught the alternative. Uh, it's like, well, if you can't do that, um, and you got to push through it, then I have nothing else to offer you for people that understand the beauty of the human body and how it should function very pain-free. You know, if you, if you look at a lot of cultures, just think of a 70, 80 year old person kind of going through these three dimensional movements of flowing and they just enjoy life into their seventies, eighties and nineties. 
there's no pain expression on their face whatsoever. It's a thing of peace. It's a thing of beauty. Uh, and they've, they've come up in a culture where, you know, pain is there for a reason, and it's there to tell us we're probably barking up the wrong part, wrong tree. Well, do you think, on that note, do you think our current society, where we spend a lot of the day seated at a desk or, you know, in a car driving from one place to another, do you think our, the way we're set up now kind of takes us away from movement literacy? Oh, goodness, yeah. It's uh, it's a kiss of death. You know, it's uh, um, my one grandson that lives nearby me. It's kind of fun because he's in a preschool now. And when I visit the preschool, it has no table and chairs. You know, it has, it has no desks. It's just this interactiveness. And they're learning things. They're, you know, he's learning things that I didn't even learn until I was in third <laughs> fourth grade. Uh, but but when I go down the hallway and I see the first grade class, it scares me because there's those chairs all lined up perfectly in order. And the, what he's going to learn in first grade from some teacher is the fun's over, the movement's over, the dissipation of your energy is over. We're going to we're going to basically put you in prison. We're going to we're going to tell you to do two things. Please be quiet and please sit down uh, and please don't talk and please don't move because I have this responsibility to somehow make you academically sound. And while we're doing that, we're killing our kids. And do you think that carries on to adulthood too? Because we in the, in the oh, workplace, right? We a lot goodness. of a lot of people in the workplace kind of get to your cubicle and boom, that's where you are for X hours a day. Yeah, it's uh, again, it's 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 uh, when you look at you know what 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 our society did a hundred years ago versus now, you know, there's probably ninety percent more people that because of the type of technology we have, they have a job where they're stuck in a cubicles, they're stuck sitting. Um, you see some of the traffic. You know, in, in some of the big cities that people get stuck in their car for 30, 40 minutes to and from work. Uh, so they, they're in their car for an hour and a half. Then they go sit in a cubicle for eight hours. And believe it or not, that causes fatigue. It's a certain type of what we call stress fatigue that when they get home, here's what they feel like doing, sitting down watching TV. And all of a sudden we expect that human body to be healthy. And that body is just begging. It's designed to move. It's designed to expend energy. It's designed to burn calories. It's designed to enjoy the freedom of movement. And yet we basically, as you properly said, not only put our kids in prison, we put us as adults in prison. And so do you think if people started a movement-based exercise program, first of all, it's not that complicated. Second of all, do you think it would help move them away from that discomfort they feel you know, throughout the day of being stuck at a desk? Yeah. Yeah, and you said the it best. It's a movement based. It's a, it's not quote unquote exercise based. It's a it's a movement. Obviously, some of them look like exercises, but if you start where I'm successful, so let's say I am somebody that's been stuck behind a desk or stuck in a car, or just don't feel like I'm an athlete. I'm kind of fearful. That's one of the behavioral drivers that keeps me away from exercise, so to speak. But if I if I came to you, for example, I know you would first assess me by allowing me to move. And you'd see where my successes were. And you wouldn't say, well, Gary, you're no good at that, so I'm going to make you do that. Or you, you can't do that, so I'm going to make you do that. Or you're, you know, you're weak at that, so I'm going to make you do that. You're going to look at me and go, wow, you do have some movement skills, Gary. Let's build upon your movement. And then let's gradually, what we would call, tweak it uh, to, to make you more successful. And then let's tweak it towards the things you want to do. And then let's tweak it so we can keep you healthy for a lifetime. That's... That would be the ultimate goal, and of course, I know that's that's your mentality, that's your ability to to do with people. But there's not a lot of people trained on on how to look at the the nice, beautiful, three dimensional global movement movement of the human body and go, ah, now I know where to go, now I know what to do, and uh, let's let's build upon that. And by the end of our session today, you're going to feel great, uh, you're going to be empowered, you're going to feel engaged. Uh, you're going to feel encouraged, and you're going to want to build upon your movement ability. And I have to say, I mean, that is one of the most powerful things I learned from you, Gary, is, is to look at somebody and build on success. And and to really, you know, that was, I took away many things of studying with you for, for the time that I did. And one of the big things was, you know, helping people walk away feeling successful from a workout. Why is that such an important thing? Well, it's, I think it's just about anything. If I If I'm not successful at something... Pretty soon, the negative feedback is going to, you know, my my, my poo bear brain uh, and my big heart is going to simply say, wow, uh, either I can't do that or it hurts or I'm frustrated or it doesn't make sense to me. And it seems like they're trying to get me to do that, which I just proved to them that I can't do. Uh, 
Um, we're, we're guilty of that in the health clubs and we're really guilty of that in physical therapy clinics. Um, if you come into a physical therapy clinic and show that I can't raise my arm because of a shoulder problem, well, believe it or not, within very nanoseconds, the therapist is trying to make your arm go up right where you showed them that they could, it couldn't go, which would cause pain. And, and if that is, you know, if that's part of rehab and you're forced to go there, that's one thing. But if that's something that, that I'm, I'm choosing myself to go to a health club or I'm actually paying additional to a trainer and they're, they're, they take me through a, a bunch of goofy exercises and give me some type of artificial grade and then say, well, because I wasn't very good at that, we're going to do a bunch of those until you get it, get it done right. Um, doesn't take long for the, for the heart of the human body and the spirit of the human body to go, this does make absolutely no sense to me. And that's why probably 99% of people who start with personal trainers quit within the first two to three weeks. Yeah, that you're probably yeah you're probably right on the money with that. Now, just a couple more questions, and uh, then we'll be able to wrap it up here. But you've you've often been described as the father of function. What what exactly does that mean? I have no idea. I think it, <laughs> I, I think it means I'm old. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I think part of it, you know, part of it is, uh, you know, I, I when I first heard it, you know, I go, uh, you know, that's kind of a goofy thing. But kind of when I hear it now, I I actually take it as a compliment because for literally. Ever since I've been in seventh grade and I knew I, want, I wanted to go in the movement industry, I've been trying to study function. How does the body really function? And if I understand it better, then I can maybe help somebody function better. That's, that's been my premise for my entire life. Um, and I think because I have looked at function maybe a little different way than a lot of people, that all of a sudden people have said, well, he, he's the father of function. He can describe function uh, fairly well. And, and, uh, but again, good fathers... Uh, end up with great kids like yourself. And so, you know, great fathers uh, end up with kids who actually do it better. And so, you know, as I hear the work that you do and and hear the information that you have gleaned from hopefully what we've learned and even made it better, well, as a proud papa, you know, I see what you do and I'm very proud. So in a way, I, I really like to be called father of function because I got a lot of little, uh, little, little kids running around that are uh, little functions and they're just doing an amazing job in the industry. So uh, uh, I guess that's uh, and initially it was embarrassing, but now I, I'm very proud of it. Well, if, if that's very kind, Gary, and I appreciate that. And for listeners, you know, I you know I have taken a lot of what I've learned from Gary over the years, and I really it's influenced quite a bit what I've studied and, and the lines I've gone down. And it's funny you brought up the kids because I teach uh, one or two workshops one on core training where I have videos of my daughters basically learning how to roll over and learning how to crawl. And, and, and the point that I try to, to tell everybody is that we already know everything we need to know about core training, just, you know, but we, uh, we forgot it, <laughs> you know, and why, why is crawling such an important movement component? I mean, why, why is that such an important skill that often gets overlooked? Well, it's interesting because even I overlooked it early on. Uh, when I, when I started studying function, I kind of got caught in under, trying to understand upright function because most people who came to me, um, wanted to do something upright. Here's what I forgot, though. Uh, the good Lord has blessed us with 12 months of on-ground training to even prepare us to do things upright. And th there's a reason for that. Uh, and like you said, it's the best core development in the world. You know, what we do when we're, you know, very early on kind of looking around for the milk, for the nipple, and all of a sudden we're kind of developing our back extensors and our heads are going up as we're, you know, looking around. And then, as you said, as you're as you've seen your daughters then kind of rock and roll and then get their first roll in, and then they realize they can kind of move across the ground and crawl. And just all of that is the, the foundation to core. I, think you, I don't think you could say it better. Everything we really needed to know about core movement, we learned before we were 12 months old. But we somehow want to uh, make it artificial. We somehow want to make it some kind of a, a, a systematic approach that – you know, basically, Pooh Bear would say that makes no sense. Pooh Bear would say, you know, I, I you know, I, uh, I feel my core the most when I fall down laughing and I'm giggling and I'm rolling on the ground with Christopher Robin playing in the leaves. Uh, he would say, when I get up, I actually move better. And we have to scratch our head and say, why do you move better? Because it's the same reason why we spend 12 months developing our core on the ground before we're allowed to even get up and and start running around as little kids. I think. A lot of times we that's I call that the hard drive, and then the software is twelve months and on. And I think we we as we develop some software glitches, 
I think it'd be behoovish to do exactly what you're suggesting is get back on the ground and do some rolling and do some crawling and just do some reaching and just kind of enjoy just the movement of the ground uh, and their interaction. And then, interestingly enough, as soon as we stand up, their little smile gets on our face and go, you know what? I'm actually moving better now that I'm upright because I went back to the hard drive. And that's such a that's such a killer concept, and I think people often overlook that, and and partly understandably, I don't think a lot of people feel comfortable rolling around on, on the floor of their gym, but it is something that people could easily easily do at home. Now, if, for people that may want to work with a trainer, you have a couple different education paths that you've developed through the Gray Institute, correct? Yes, uh, we we uh, the, you know the the enchilada is the one that you went through called gift program. Uh, we just finished our 11th year. We have about uh, 950 people throughout the world who have gone through a 40-week mentorship program on movement and on function. And again, those are, as a proud papa, Dr. Dave Tiberio and myself get a big smile on our face because we see, um, for example, the amazing work that you're doing you know, in springboarding from that and your integration of all the other things that you've learned and you, that you continue to learn. And so... Um, that that's a that's a powerful group of people that can you know help people literally th- throughout the world. Um, that information obviously can be found on GrayInstitute.com, but we've also developed a, a couple of things that allow us to really assess movements called 3D maps. It's exactly what I talked about: an upright three-dimensional movement process uh, that allows you to see where your successes are. Interesting enough, we now have 3D maps on ground assessment, so we realize. You know, hey, I need to know what your abilities on ground are, what, what, what part of your hard drive is still intact, and what part of the hard drive still needs some work. Um, and so we're able to take a look at your successes uh, on ground and upright and build upon those successes. And then we have a program called CABS, which allows us to zero in a little more on specific joints while still integrated. So we would actually work on your hip while we're still working on your shoulder and feet at the same time. Uh, in kind of what we call an interactive chain reaction way, so we're uh, we're kind of working working as hard as we can to empower professionals like yourself to even be more significant to their clients, and uh, that's 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 hopefully one of the legacies we can leave. Well, I, I pre- again, I appreciate your kind words uh, about the the contribution I've made, and and one of the powerful things about going through your community was or going through your mentorship was developing that community. And, and for listeners, a number of the leaders in the fitness industry have studied under Gary over the years. So if you've, if you've been working with a trainer or you've been following somebody and, and this sounds familiar to you, well, you're talking to the guy who I think was, is the OG, the original gangster in the, in the, whole, in the whole movement, if you will. Um, and, and is there a way that people can find a, a trainer who's gone through one of your programs, either through CAFS or the Gray Institute? Do you have a searchable yeah. function on your website? Yeah, all they have to do is go to the Gray Institute website, and then there's what's called a gift locator. And so the locator will allow you to find a gift fellow in your area. Now, again, there's only 950 of them throughout the world, and so it may or may not be. What a lot of people do, though, is they'll just, uh, they'll just send us a note or an email. They'll just uh, info at grayinstitute.com, and we'll even check to see if there's somebody in the area. In fact, I had just four... Uh, on Thursday and Friday, people from around the country and one from a, a, a foreign land, so to speak, say, hey, uh, I've heard about what your gift fellows are able to do. I'd really like to find somebody in my neighborhood. Is there somebody in this particular area? We'll do some digging. Um, and if not, we, we can actually kind of hook you up with somebody that can start even online giving you some advice and assessing and, and assisting with your own therapist and your own trainer. We, we certainly don't do that to take clients away from their own therapist and trainer. We want to put our arms around the therapist and trainer and say, hey, we've done this for 42 years. Um, we've made a few mistakes. In fact, we've made a lot of mistakes, but we have, we have some interesting ways to get people to move better, more effectively, efficiently with less pain. We're here to help. So people can just go to grantstute.com, uh, dig around, and even there's probably about uh, 1,200 videos on there that they can access to start learning more about kind of how we do things and, and why we do things. And I'll have links to that down in the show notes below as well. You have a lot of information up on YouTube as well, Gary, don't you? Yeah, we have a lot on YouTube. And then probably if, if I was a listener and I wanted to really understand a lot of what we we're doing, I'd go to our our free website. It's f2pacademy.com. It's F2P stands for free to play. 
and just type on matrix plays. And there's about 140 matrix plays that starts you from ABC and gets you to XYZ. And uh, they're interactive. You just kind of follow along. Um, and But they're fun and they're uplifting. And at the end of the day, we teach them in order to help kids empower each other. And what we're finding is uh, a lot of us kids, 70, 60 and 70 year olds, like them even more than the six and seven year olds. Because we realize we don't have a lot of time left to inspire people. Um, we see a little bit of the writing on the wall. When you're six or seven, you're not thinking about, um, you know, when, when you get to move on. When you're 60 and 70, you do. And so you want the best quality of life uh, that you can possibly have. And you want to help your family and you want to help your grandkids and you want to help your neighbors. And you kind of want to go out with a, with a smile on your face saying, you know what? I kept myself as healthy as long as I could. I really perspired in order that I could help other people so I could inspire others. So that's a pretty cool website as well. That's, uh, and are you still playing basketball regularly, Gary? Yep, I am, I'm. I'm. I'm afraid I am. I, it's. Uh, it's. Uh, I say that because uh, uh, the team that I play on. This is our 42nd year together, uh, and so it's now me and another guy that are only the two part of the original, as you say, original gangster, so to speak. And uh, and now I have the privilege of playing with one of my sons. Um, the only problem with that is I can recall a number of times last year where I came off a beautiful pick, wide open. And uh, my son Doug faked the, faked the ball to me and shot. So, and uh, when I, when I kind of asked him about it, he says, "Well, would you pass to you?" And I go, nah, "I don't think so anymore." So, but I can still foul if I can catch you. Uh, that's the hard part. But I still enjoy full court basketball. I still do triathlons. Um, you know, I love golf. Uh, and selfishly, I want to stay healthy as long as I can. But selfishly, I want to do it so I can still hopefully inspire others and. Uh, Get, get other people to understand about human movement, the love and the joy of movement, and uh, get a big smile on my face when I realize, uh, you know, what my kids such as Pete McCall are doing and uh, appreciate the contribution they're making to uh, to so many, blessing so many with their blessings. So, uh, yep, I st- I'm still talking along a little bit. Well, Gary, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate the work you're doing. Please give my best to Keith and Doug and, and the rest of the team back there and Adrian. That means a lot. And I just appreciate you reaching out. But again, I don't think I can uh, uh, overstate uh, just how proud we are of you. And we see a lot of the stuff you're doing. And, and uh, you can tell your heart and passion is to empower others. And uh, we just appreciate that. And we appreciate being able to con- contribute any way we can. All right. Thanks a lot, Gary. Well, I'll bet you didn't think you'd hear about Pooh Bear in a conversation about fitness, did you? <laughs> And I say that, you know, I remember the first uh, workshop I took with Gary was probably 2002 or 2003, and it was after just hearing about him, and and I heard a number of other educators in the fitness industry always refer to Gary. And I remember specifically when Juan Carlos Santana, this was back in 1999, so it's it's been a year or two, um, but I was at a a conference, uh, and Juan Carlos Santana was doing a workshop on the Dumbbell Matrix, which Gary created, and, you know, Carlos, Juan Carlos learned from him. And, and I interviewed us, you know, Juan Carlos Santana a number of episodes ago. You can find that on the podcast. But, but Carlos had me go through the, the, the dumbbell matrix, and it kicked my butt. And at the time, I was a 20-something meathead training in the traditional style, lift heavy, bench press, deadlift, not even deadlift, bench press, leg press, squat, you know, all that stuff. And, and Juan Carlos kicked my butt with a dumbbell matrix, and that's when I really started to learn more about functional movement. And that's the time in the early 2000s when functional training first became popular. And I really do feel we're getting ready to go through like a second evolution of functional training in the fitness industry. And really, functional training is just training people how to move better. Gary was one of the first people to come up and say, hey, guys, we should be training the entire system. We should be training the entire system as one unit. Because when we look at how the body moves, the body's always in contact with the ground. The body's body's always influenced by gravity and ground reaction. And ground reaction forces are those forces that come up into the body every time you place your foot down on the ground. The ground reaction force, you know, is different. You get a different ground reaction force when walking on concrete than walking on sand, than walking on a wood floor, or walking on deep grass. So in your exercise program, whatever it is that you're training for, you have to consider what's your environment going to be. Because if you want to go out and play in beach volleyball, for example, you're playing in a very dynamic environment. 
gravity and ground reaction forces are going to are going to change differently based on the surface sand it's a variable surface you know if you like playing a lot of outdoor basketball on concrete you have to train to be reactive on that on that environment and gary's the one who won the first ones to kind of really raise his hand and say hey why aren't we doing a better job you know why are we only treating the knee the knee is a joint stuck between the foot and the hip you know if we're going to treat the knee if we're going to you know address knee soreness well we got to address the hip we got to address the ankle and treat the whole system you know even now a lot of physical therapy clinics you go into you know if you have shoulder pain they'll just take a look at your shoulder they might not look down to your hip they might not look down to your foot but your body is one system so therefore we should train as a system that's why i wanted to have gary on the podcast because gary was the one who really changed that paradigm he really had a major influence for how fitness and physical therapy but you know, it's not my world. Fitness is my world. You know, Gary helped change the paradigm, you know, along with some of the other people I've interviewed on this podcast. You know, Paul Check changed it. Juan Carlos Santana changed it. You know, Gray Cook has done a significant amount to change it. You know, one of the things that's a lot of fun um, on this podcast is talking to some of the people who have really influenced where we are in fitness today. So when you walk into your gym, if you go into your gym tonight or this week and you have a trainer, you know, you're doing multiple, multiple planar lunges where you go lunging to the side and you're lunging around, well, Gary had an influence on that. You know, if you're looking, if you have a trainer talking about movement patterns, you know, Gary and Gray both had influences on that. You know, a number of years ago when I worked for this one health club company, I was looking at different education systems and I spoke to Gary, Gary Gray, and I spoke to Gray Cook and and Gray, they actually learned from Gary Gray. A lot of people in our industry have learned from Gary and applied it in different practices. That's why when Gary talks about having a lot of, you know, quote, children out there in industry, he means it. He's had a significant influence. He's one of these guys in the background. So that's why it was such an honor to have him on the podcast today. And that's why I wanted to try to share his insight and his knowledge with you. And Gary's approach, we didn't really de- delve too deeply into this, you know, in our conversation but one of Gary's things, and one of the things I really respect about him, is he's a, he's a very devout Christian. Yeah, that's not you know I'm you know I'm not that's don't really I'm not that religious, but I certainly respect people who are. And Gary is a devout Christian, and one of the things he talks about, and I believe this, that if you treat the body and you treat the mind, meaning you give people the ability to do more, then you also treat the spirit. All three things work. To, all three things work together: body, mind, and spirit. And think about that. When you've had pain, when you've had pain, your brain will tell you you can't do certain things. Your mind will say, I can't do that because it puts me in pain. And so what happens to your spirit? You know, you become a little bit depressed. But when you're out of pain, when you move, when you go out and enjoy the things you want to do, playing golf, shooting hoops, you know, Gary likes to do both those things. You know, running, you know, riding a bike, riding a mountain bike. When you go out and you have the ability to do what you want to do, when your body allows you to do what you want to do, it puts your mind in a better frame. That, in turn, influences your, your spirit, and you're happier. You're more productive. You're a better person to be around. You know, when was the last time you walked into a gym and said, today is the day I'm going to train my spirit. Today is the day I'm going to train my attitude. But if you train to move better, you're going to feel better as a result. You know, for more information about Gary Gray, you can go to the Gray Institute. I'm going to have the website down there. We talked about a couple of different websites. You can find the links down below in the show notes. I really thank you for tuning in today. This was a, an important conversation for me. Gary has been a significant influence in my career, and it really was. Uh, it was truly, and I don't mean to overuse this phrase, but it's truly an honor to spend a little bit of time with him talking about what it is that he does and to share that with you out there in the audience. So again, here's the tagline. If you like this content, if you're enjoying it, please do me a favor. Give me a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio or however you listen to this and just let other people know that this is a podcast worth listening to. Just trying to grow my numbers and trying to grow the listeners so I can get this information out to more people. I'm also answering questions on my quick fit tips. If you have a question you want answered, please send it to me via email, pete at petemccallfitness.com. You can also find me on the Twitter. My Twitter handle is at petemc underscore fitness. You can always tweet me a question. I'll be more than happy to try to answer it on a future podcast. Also on Instagram, I also put my podcast and other content up on Instagram. My Instagram handle is at Pete McCall underscore fitness on Instagram. 
Folks, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a healthy day, and I look forward to having you stop by for future episodes of All About Fitness.